Well, good evening, good evening, everybody. How are you guys? Talking to this big room, it feels like everybody's all spread out all over the place here, so hopefully you've got plenty of room here. You can, no, it's not mine. I don't know who put a sandwich up here for us. So. Somebody brought us a sandwich. Um. <laughs> Oh, well, we're going to jump in tonight. We, uh, it's good to be back. A uh, little, took a little uh, detour last week with a legacy presentation. So uh, hope you guys are ready to jump back in and continue our look at the gospel. And so tonight we will be thinking about a couple of just incredibly, incredibly rich words that we see in Scripture dealing with redemption and reconciliation. We're probably going to spend most of our time looking at the word redemption, um, but, but we're going to jump into both of these tonight, okay? So let's pray, and we'll jump in. And so let me, let me do that for us. Father, we just pause tonight just to say thank you for this time where we can open your word, uh, and God, from the pages of, of Scripture, uh, God, we can, we can see your character. We can see your heart. We can understand uh, your plans and what you are doing uh, in the world, what you're doing in our lives. Uh, and God, through your word, we can know you better. And so I pray that that would be what happens tonight through this time that we have together. Would you just open our eyes uh, to see your word? God, would your spirit teach us tonight? Uh, and reveal truth to us, and uh, even show us how we can apply it uh, to, to the everyday stuff of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so a um, little exercise at your table. Uh, it may just be you or two or three people, but here's what I want you to take about two to three minutes to do. I want you to write down what you think the word redemption means. What is redemption? Go, take two or three minutes. Think of your answer. What is redemption? We got some good, good attempts. Any, anyone uh, courageous enough to give us their definition of redemption? See a lot of people with their eyes down still, they're like, don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. You won't with call the on me. <laughs> Anyone? I won't pick on anyone, but you, you have to... Huh? To buy back? To be rescued? Okay, a second chance. That's good. Yeah, these are good. We're, we're on it. Okay, so uh, redemption in, uh, in the ancient world was, was actually a, a technical term. Um, that had to do with the purchase of someone out of slavery, okay? So uh, you got to think in the ancient world, there, there are two main reasons that you, would, uh, that you would go into slavery. One would be debt, finances. Um, they, they didn't have bankruptcy, right? You, you couldn't file Chapter 7 and, uh, you know, work through some sort of system, so what you do is, is you sold your debt and you, you made yourself a bond slave. But the other, the other main way that you could become a slave was through being a prisoner of war. So, so if, if your side lost, uh, right, they, they captured uh, a lot of the men and made them slaves. But there was, there was a particular bounty that was on a price that was on an individual's head. But you could, or someone that you, you knew, uh, could purchase you out, okay? Purchase your freedom, right? And that is this word, right? To, to buy back, that is this word. To buy you out of slavery is this word redemption. So this... This word is it's so rich, and we are going to see tonight that this really is the, the theme. You could rightly say this is the theme of the whole Bible. The Bible is a redemption story. Uh, there's a, a, an author 
um, that's, that's popular right now. He's written several books here in the last few years named Trevin Wax. And so I put a quote in there for you. Uh, he says, there is a story, one big story in the stories, and he's talking about the Bible. Saying going through all of the stories in the Bible, there is one big story. And we could say that is a redemption story, this story of, of buying back, of, of rescuing. Um, Jesus even alludes to this, that the Bible has a big theme that is all about him. And you've got some verses there in your notes, but one of those is in John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and these self-righteous guys. They, are, they know their Old Testament. They know the Torah, the first five books of, of, of the Bible. They know the prophets. They, 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 you know, they pride themselves in their knowledge. And he says to them, hey, you search the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, because you think that in them... You have eternal life, that you're searching, that your knowledge is what is going to give you eternal life. And he, but then he tells them, and it is those scriptures that bear witness of me. He's telling them, you guys are missing it. Like when you read your Old Testament, you were missing the fact that it all is pointing to me and what I have come to do, this redemption that I have come to purchase for you. So Jesus says the Bible is a redemption story. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4, when he, is, when he is talking about false gospels that have infiltrated the church, and then he starts talking about the beauty of the gospel and what God has done in his grace uh, he, he talks about this. Look at this passage here in Galatians chapter 4. He says, In the same way we also, when we were children, we were what? Enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. That was our condition apart from Christ. But then look at what he says. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we could receive adoption as sons. But that phrase there, and we don't have time to do it tonight, but it is, it's incredible to pause and, and consider that phrase, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. It is this idea that all of history was building to that moment when God would send his son, when the word would become flesh and dwell among us, that this is what all of history was longing for, and this is what God presented at the perfect time. And we could just do a history lesson and see how the world was in this unique place where it had never been before and it's never been that way since when God chose to send his son. And, it was, and why did he do it? To redeem us. Do you see that there in verse five? Why would he do that? To redeem those of us who were slaves, who were in bondage because we were lawbreakers. We could not keep the law, but God chose to redeem us and adopt us as his, as his, as his sons to, to bring us into his family. The Bible is a redemption story, and I want you to understand that because when you understand that as this overarching storyline story and thread of Scripture, then when you start to read your Bible, you see it everywhere. And that is what, and it brings the Bible to life in just unbelievable ways. Like you can't just take my word for it. You just have to do it. You have to put on like redemption goggles and you have to start reading scripture. And you're like, oh my goodness, I see it everywhere when I look at it through that lens. Okay. And so here's another exercise we're going to do for a few minutes. Uh, I want you to do it on your own at your table. You can do it in, in groups or you can do it by yourself. But I'm going to tell you something. There's an old pastor from Dallas, uh, W.A. Criswell, that said he preached, uh, I don't know how many messages it was, but he had this, this series of messages that he called the scarlet thread. And basically it was this, that the Bible 
The whole thing is pointing to Jesus. The whole thing is this redemption story. And so he went through the whole Bible telling this one big story of redemption. And so, you guys, we've been doing this now for several weeks, right? I see a lot of just Bible scholars in the room. You guys look like Bible scholars, okay? So here's what I want you to do for a few minutes. On the page that you have there in front of you that says the story of redemption, the scarlet thread, page 56, you've got a whole page there of just blank lines. If you've got a pen, I want you just to start jotting down stories in Scripture that are redemption stories. Like how do we see redemption? And just do this. Start with the Old Testament. Don't jump into the New Testament, okay? That's too easy because you could just write Jesus and you've got it, okay? Start in the Old Testament. How do you see redemption running through the Old Testament? Are there stories? Are there themes? Are there these pictures of things that are happening that God is doing that just scream redemption? Just take two or three minutes and jot some down and then we're gonna walk through kind of a scarlet thread together after you do that, okay? All right. No, no cheating off of each other's papers. Or do I see that? I mean, do your own work. We're just sharing. Well, it's never going to be. I think that Paul is Googling. Paul is Googling. Oh, okay. Is that what it's saying? All right. I don't know if that's his iPad or his phone he's holding up, but I think he's Googling. All right, so, so we, we said, tell, tell us some of, some of the stories you immediately think of when you hear redemption. Okay, what part of Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar had a, a number of things. What part of it? Nebuchadnezzar's story. Yeah, what part of his story? He was made to be for seven years. Yeah, when, when he became a, a wild animal. So he's, he's immediately hit with a lot of calamity. Okay. Spiritual warfare going on. Complete redemption to more than what he had even had in the previous. Yeah. Again, when they kill the Lord, he has got to have that. Yeah. The suffering of his. I love the end of Job, right? God blessed his latter years even more than the former. Yeah. That's a great, great picture. Other spots of redemption. Joseph. Joseph, yeah. Take me through. Why Joseph? That's right. Yeah. So the salvation comes through the very act. So you get you get this massive betrayal get this this drama of, of being uh, in slavery but then the Lord's hand pulls him out and then it comes full circle with uh, with the uh, him being able to abundantly survive in the midst of famine and then forgive his brothers yeah in Jesus and Joseph family yeah yep Good. Other stories you guys think of? There's one in the back. I say it too. <laughs> Behind you, she was raising her hand. Oh, I'm pointing back to Leah, where the unsavory wife says, No, God pushed back, but yet, oh, it's you that said it. Oh, that's great. I'll yeah. That. Did you guys hear? She said, Leah, you remember Leah was uh, Jacob's unfavored wife, um, and yet the Lord blessed her and then the line of Judah came from from Leah. It's great. 
Yes, ma'am. David and Jonathan's son, maybe. Right. David and Jonathan's son, like Mephibosheth? Yes. Yes, the story of David's kindness toward Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, is, is an incredible picture of the gospel. Uh, and it is a redemption story for sure. Right there. Look that one up, guys. Mephibosheth. Look up the story of David, David and Mephibosheth. Rahab? How so? Take us through Rahab. Tell us, Miss Satan. Well, she put out the scarlet thread that. Uh, so she's got to be. <laughs> yeah. He's got a piece. He's got a piece. She, she used the scarlet. But, you know, you, I've read books. I'm sure y'all have only just the scarlet thread mm -hmm. from Genesis all the way through. Yeah. So to me, she was really, you know, she really stepped out there and, and looked. And the expansion in the. In the all the same, yeah. yeah. In the genealogy, of Jesus. yeah, that word um, for the the cord she threw over to be recognized. That word in Hebrew is tikva, which is the word for hope, right? So in throwing, and it's a, and it's this scarlet cord that she's throwing out her window, and this is like she is placing all of her hope. Her entire life is now in the the, the putting this tikva out her window right it is the it is the word for hope in the hebrew language like all of her her entire future is in if god does not come through on his promise to rescue then i'm a goner so yeah she switched teams she she knew that she was on the wrong side and wanted to switch to to god's side and that's that's how she did it powerful paul the nation of israel in what in what way? Pick one. There's a whole book about them. The whole book is written. The nation of Israel is all about this, time and time again. Yes. Could you even up to today? Is there a particular story that you want to highlight? <laughs> oh, how about the Exodus? No, no, no. no. <laughs> that's, that's too easy. Yeah, that's too easy. Which one were you googling? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get but I can't. Well, we'll get back to it. I, I was thinking about Naomi, um, Ruth's daughter in law, how the Lord uh, spared, he took her in and put her in the line. Well, tonight, in just a few minutes, we are going to do a deep dive into the story of Ruth and Boaz. So, uh, get ready. What about the Abraham Isaac people? Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Amen. These are good. Okay, yeah, the, yeah, the father in mean, the prodigal Jesus parable, right, of the lost, the lost son. It's good. All right. Well, good. You're thinking very well. Um, so let's just do, let's just do a quick run through the Old Testament at a really quick pace, but just see how we see this thread running through through the Old Testament scriptures leading up to what Paul said in Galatians 4. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. So if we start at the beginning, a very good place to start. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have the creation account. And what do we know about the world in Genesis 1 and 2? What kind of world is it? It's perfect. Everything is in harmony. Right? Everything works as it should. Um, it is sinless, but Genesis chapter 3 changes everything. What happens in Genesis chapter 3? The fall. Adam and Eve rebel, right? This de-godding of God in their lives, right? They want to become like God. They want to know good and evil. Uh, they want to question God, uh, question his goodness, question whether he's holding out on them, being a cosmic like buzzkill, uh, keeping something from them. 
And so they take the bait of the serpent, hook, line, and sinker, uh, and they disobey God, and sin enters the world. And right there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see the first hint, uh, this first picture of the gospel where, uh, say, where, G, where God tells the serpent, right? Like, hey, you will strike the heel of the seed of the woman, but he will crush your head, right? Like God, basically God is saying, you know, Satan, you know, you think you've won, but you are defeated, right? From the seed of the woman, like I am going to redeem, I'm going to buy back, <laughs> my people that you have put now into slavery uh, to sin. And so now, and then, the, and then it, we just go from there. So from there, as we go through Genesis, right, we could see how the world just gets more and more wicked. Right? Cain and Abel, right? Within, within just a few years, we have the first murder. Right? Sin is entered the world. Now we have brother killing brother. Um, and the wickedness gets so bad that by G Genesis chapter 6, uh, Noah is on the scene and God says, you know, I'm sorry that I ever made man. They are so wicked. And it says, but Noah was righteous in comparison to the wickedness of his day. Noah is righteous. And so what does God, what does God do with Noah? Yeah, he, he starts over with Noah. He says, I'm going to start over with, with Noah. But does it work? No, right? Even, even with Noah himself, we see, I mean, right out of the ark, right? Noah is already sinning, right? Sin is continuing just to, it's, it's infected humanity, right? Even as God starts over, sin is still there. We get to the Tower of Babel just a few chapters later after Noah's story, and we see that here this, all the human race is gathered together in this place, and they say, we're going to build a name for ourselves. Rather than be image bearers of God, they are going to try to lift up and exalt their name. So we see this infecting uh, humanity, like sin has this hold on the human race. But then God, though, is not done. In Genesis chapter 12, God chooses... A man. What's his name? And what does he do with Abraham? He makes a... He, yeah, he, he, prom, he makes a promise to Abraham. What's the, what's the Bible word we would use there? A covenant with Abraham that through his descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So here's another one of those pictures. God is doing something. It's this, it's this picture of redemption is coming. God is going to do something. And then we could pick up, if you want to take it for a minute, what do we see moving even from Abraham? Well, that God, God selects uh, a family, a man, uh, Jacob. And Jacob himself is a trickster. But God redeems Jacob, doesn't he? Right? What does he switch Jacob's name to? To Israel, right? And then even with, with Jacob's sons, remember someone had highlighted uh, Joseph as a, a type, a story of redemption. And you can, you can trace the line with each of the sons and you realize, are these guys perfect? Not even close, not even close. But, uh, so bad. but God is, is constantly pulling forward salvation and promises, moving moving forward. And then the people literally go into slavery, into Egypt. And what does God do? He redeems them out, right? He purchases them out. That story, that Exodus story, becomes uh, one of the major, major storylines of the Bible, okay? The Exodus, that picture of coming out of slavery is uh, it's supposed to be remembered in many, many festivals, okay? The reason for that is because God wants you to remember that because it becomes that picture of salvation. And then later on in the Bible, you're constantly told to look back. 
But then when Israel gets so bad and they disobey again, and then they go, uh, they, they get uh, enslaved by Babylon, what are we promised after that? A second exodus. Did you know that? Has anyone ever heard of the second exodus? Okay. Well, when the Bible points forward to the second exodus, it's actually pointing forward to when Jesus comes, the ultimate exodus. Because it's not just going to be buying back from Babylon. Because remember, did the first exodus solve all the problems? No. So actually, what, what, as you chase these threads through, like someone gets in a lot of trouble and God saves them out. And you think, oh, well, now they're going to be fine. But no, they get in a lot of trouble again and then God saves them out. So you see all of these movements from individuals to the whole people um, to, uh, all right, we were enslaved and then we came out. And then they went back into slavery. And so that's why when you get to the end of the, uh, when you get to the end of the Old Testament, it's promising, like, there's going to be, there's going to be a different redemption, a new kind of redemption, because everything that we've seen so far is only picturing in ways the ultimate redemption and the ultimate promise that is coming. And so when we do a deep dive and we look uh, here through the book of Ruth here in a moment, that's one of those incredible stories of redemption. You're going to see just this amazing thread, but we're also going to talk about how it whets our appetite or makes us anticipate the real redemption that's coming later. That's why if you're going to be, the reason uh, uh, Chris Well wanted you to know about all these scarlet threads is because when you read them, when you read the story of Joseph, okay, do you think you're supposed to only stop at Joseph? No. You see, a good Bible reader and a Christian later looks back and goes, oh, you know what? There's, there's some of those things in that Joseph story that are actually pointing to Jesus. And you look at the Exodus, and you, you kind of think through that. You go, hey, wait a second. There's some of those things in that Exodus and in that Passover. They're kind of pointing to Jesus, <laughs> okay? And that's what we're going to do when we walk through the book of Ruth. We're going to look at it. We go, oh, my goodness, what a magnificent story. It's true, yes. We're going to see these redemption threads, but we're going to be good Bible readers. What are we going to say? Oh, look at how that points to Jesus. That's right. So you ready to jump into Ruth for a little bit? All right, so if you've got your Bible, turn to the book of Ruth, because this is, it's a deep dive, but it is a really fast deep dive into, <clears throat> into Ruth here, okay? I'm going to stand up, because I can't talk fast if I'm sitting down. <laughs> All right, so let's look right away in chapter one because we need to see the setting for the story because the setting sets up for us this snapshot of the human condition, man in his sin, okay? And I can show you this here in Ruth chapter one we see that in the days when the judges ruled, so this is in the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land of Israel, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. All right? So Elimelech, let me just tell you, his name means my God is king. But this is very interesting. Here you have a guy whose name means my God, Yahweh, is king, but he is leaving the land that God had given them, and he's going to a foreign land with pagan gods, right? And he is looking to just take matters into his own hands rather than trusting the Lord to provide. He takes off with his family and goes to this foreign land. So you see this picture here, but it it gets even more incredible as we go on here, the writer of Ruth tells us that the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Do you know what their names mean? Sick and dying. You think they're going to last long? Not in this story, right? They don't make it out of the first paragraph, 
right? They're goners, right? And so you see this. So even in just the beginning of Ruth, we see this snapshot, the condition of humanity because of sin, right? There is the allegiance to God, right, is, is in name only. Their hearts are far from him, right? Mankind is sick and dying as a result of sin. They are starving. They are, there's a famine in the land. There's a famine in our hearts, right? They are now, they have gone to a foreign land, and now they're stuck there, right? Elimelech dies within the first few verses, and then Malon and Chilion, as their name suggest, they don't make it either. And, and as you're reading, as a good Bible reader, when you understand there's a famine in the land of Israel, why do you think that there's a famine in the land of Israel? Yeah, Sadie's right. If you couldn't hear her, she said disobedience. So if you recall, when God gave Israel the land, what did he promise them? He promised that, that rains would come in their season, that it would be plentiful in, in harvest, that the land would be good to them. But that's if they were obedient. If they were disobedient, what would God do? He would send things like famine. So the moment you read, oh, there's famine in the land, you know the condition of the people spiritually in the land that's caused this to take place. That's why, I mean, how awful it is to have to leave the land that God has promised you. Why'd you leave? Because there wasn't any food. Why was there no food? Because everyone was disobedient. It's so bad, right? If we were, we don't have time to really dig in, but Elimelech dies, Naomi there is now a widow, her two sons die. They have, before they pass away, they've married two women of Moab. Is that following God's instructions to the people of Israel? No, they've taken pagan wives. Um, and so, but those ladies named Orpah and Ruth, um, they've married them, but now Ruth, Naomi says, I'm going back because maybe... You know, uh, I can, I hear there's food in the land again. And so I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. And so the daughter-in-law start out on the journey with her. Orpah turns back and doesn't go. Ruth, Ruth goes with her. But I want you just to look, Ruth chapter 1, verse 21. This is, this is such a good summary of just the condition of the people uh, right now, just in what Naomi says about herself. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Isn't that just a sobering but accurate picture of what sin does in our lives? It just leaves us empty. And Naomi says, this is me. I am coming back to the land that God promised, and I am empty. I have nothing. And then in chapter two, we see the need. What does Naomi need? Now she's got her daughter-in-law with her, Ruth. What is the need? Look at verse one here. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. We love Boaz in the story of Ruth, don't we? Right? But, but think about what is it Naomi needs? She needs someone to provide for her. Ruth needs, some, they need someone to provide. They're coming back with nothing. That's what Naomi says. I'm coming back empty. Who is going to provide for her? Right? Well, it, some context, you've got passages here. You can go back and look at these later, but God in his grace and mercy had instituted some laws in his, in, 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 in the Jewish nation. One is about the kinsman redeemer. Right, this idea that if there is someone in this kind of poverty, in this kind of need, there is an obligation in their closest of kin to rescue them, to redeem them from having to become slaves, right? To buy their land and, and to then be able, and to provide for them interest free so that they can survive. This idea of someone that would step in and be this kinsman redeemer. Naomi needs that. Right? There's also this picture of, uh, it's called the Leverite law of the Leverite marriage, which is if, if, a, if a man dies and his wife 
is, is childless, it is the obligation of the next of kin to produce an heir for him so that his name does not disappear from the face of the earth. So these two things are at play and they're going to come up in the book of Ruth, but there is a great need that Naomi and Ruth have. Look at verse three in chapter two here. So Ruth just happened, it says, right? It says she set out. She's like, I've got to go and, and get grain for us so that we don't starve. Is what Ruth, Ruth and Naomi realize. She's got to go gather grain. And she just happens to come to the part of the field that belonged to who? So there's a need, but we start to see this picture. God is going to provide. Verse 10, we see that Boaz shows favor. Now, uh, Ruth says to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Ruth knows she's a pagan. She knows that she does not belong in this land. And here is Boaz seeing the need, right? And he, he not only allows her to pick up the, the grain that his workers drop, but he says, you stay just in my field. Let me take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. And he then later in the chapter, he lets her eat at his table. He lets her dine with him and his men, and then he even tells them to drop extra grain. So we start to see this provision of the Lord in the life of Ruth and Naomi. And then Naomi devises a plan, right? There's a plan here, right? I love, I love Naomi. She's, she's sitting here like, all right, let me, I'm thinking here, there's something going on here. So you've been in Boaz's field, Boaz likes you, right? if we were thinking of it like this, like a good, like, you know, drama on, romantic drama on TV, makes a great Hallmark movie. Um, but Naomi has this plan like, hey, go back to Boaz, verse four of chapter three. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies and go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do, right? Not a custom we practice today, but this is a picture here, right? This is a proposal of marriage from Ruth to Boaz by this action. That's what Naomi is saying. Go, go humble yourself before Boaz and say, hey, if you'll have me, you know, I will be your wife. Um, and Ruth is obedient. She, she, she follows her mother-in-law's instructions, verses six through nine of chapter three, and she goes and she does that very thing. And look, at, look in verse 9. Boaz, Boaz sees that she's come. He's laid down. She's laid down at his feet. And she says to him, he goes, who are you? Who is this here in the dark that's laid down at my feet? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Bless you. So now we see, if we were to read on in verses 10 and 11, Boaz says, may you be blessed, my daughter. And he says, I will, do not fear. I am a redeemer and I will redeem you. I mean, that's, that's the picture if we just fast forward and summarize this here. Boaz is willing to redeem. And then chapter four, as the book ends, is how the redemption happens, right? And there's details there. There's, a, there's someone who is closer in relation to Naomi than Boaz. So he has first right to be the redeemer. And he says, oh, I'll be happy to be the kinsman redeemer, to buy the land and to provide for them. But Boaz says, no, if you're going to fulfill that one, you've also got to fulfill the Leverite marriage law too and produce an heir for the family so that their name does not go away. And the guy goes, no, I want no part of that, right? And so Boaz says, well, I will be the redeemer. So they go through the ritual. They, they follow all the steps that's prescribed in the law. And Boaz then becomes the redeemer who marries Ruth he provides for Naomi and Ruth. He buys back the land so that they don't have to go into slavery. They have a son. Do you know Naomi and, or, or Boaz and Ruth's son? One before. They have a son named Obed. Obed has a son named, and Jesse has a son named 
David, right? So now we, I mean, it's this beautiful, beautiful picture, but we see something here in this picture of the kinsman redeemer. There are some things here about that have to be in place in order for this story to be such a beautiful picture of redemption. First of all, there had to be a kinsman. There had to be a relative that would do this, what Boaz did. This relative had to be free himself. He could not be in debt or be in bondage if he's going to be the redeemer. He has to be able to pay the price. He's got to have the means to to buy back, and he also has to be willing to pay the price. Is Boaz, does he check all of those boxes in the story? But what is this pointing to? As Jason said, we're going to see redemption here, but as a good Bible student, yeah, Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 11. I want you to see something. I meant to already have it pulled up and... Just a little disclaimer, we're not going to get to reconciliation tonight, but that's okay. We'll get to it another night. Look at, in Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Skip down to verse 17. And therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. When Scripture calls Jesus our brother, when it uses that language, that that familial language, Right? It's, it's this picture here, right? This picture here of, of, the, of a kinsman redeemer, right? The one who would buy back. Do you see this here? Like Jesus, right, is, is the better Boaz in this, in this situation, right? He, he is the kinsman. Is he free of debt and bondage? Yeah. What are passages of scripture that we might think of that would, that would tell us that Jesus is qualified to be our redeemer, that he is free of debt and bondage. What is your, what is your debt or bondage? What do we call that? Sin. So how do we know Jesus is free of debt and bondage? Amen. Yeah, what verse is that? You remember? It's, it's, it's the one he's got written down right here. Yeah, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So yes, he made him to be sin. The important phrase there is who knew no sin. Jesus is free of sin. So he can be the redeemer. He is our kinsman. Right? He came in his incarnation. He came fully God, fully man. Right? He is our kinsman. He is free of sin. He knew no sin. Is he able to pay the price? Oh, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Turn back over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without what? So is Jesus able to pay the price for our sin? Why? Yeah, because he had no sin, so he could pay the price for our sin. But then there's one more thing. Kinsman, got to be free of debt and bondage himself. He's got to be able to purchase, to pay the price, but he also has to be willing to pay the price. Was Jesus willing to be our redeemer? Where do we, I mean, we could give a host of passages 
that would tell us that, but what's one that comes to your mind? That's right. Yeah. God, thy will be done. I will, I will drink this cup. Yes. How about Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, where it says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Was Jesus willing to be our Redeemer? Yeah. Yeah. This beautiful picture of Boaz redeeming Ruth, Elimelech's family, right? It's it's a beautiful picture, but do you see what it points to? Do you see that it points to this picture of what Christ was going to do for us? Isn't that incredible to see those connections that that run here, how we see the gospel in the story of Ruth? There's one more thing I want to do before we go. Do you have anything else you want to talk about in Ruth before we look at, at the, um, this other piece here that is such a beautiful picture of the gospel? No, you want to go on to this? Yeah. All right. So look at verse 9 of chapter 3. Of Ruth. Of Ruth. Sorry, we've been all over the Bible. It's good. <laughs> of Ruth. Where Ruth... Page 222 in my Bible. (laughs) All right. So before we look there, I need you to look back. I should have had my Bible open. Back in chapter 2. Oh, back in 2. Back in chapter 2 here. I've got it highlighted in my Bible. All right, so this is before... Ruth has come and laid at the feet of Boaz and proposed marriage. This is when she's in the fields, uh, and Boaz just shows her kindness by allowing her to continue to glean there and even giving her extra. Um, And she's like, why have you been so kind to me? And he says, you have done so much for your mother-in-law, and you've shown such kindness and and all of these things that he tells her. And he, but then Boaz Boaz is astute. He, he recognizes something. He says, the Lord will repay you for what you've done, Ruth, the kindness you've shown your mother-in-law, and a full reward will be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. Right? The, the bigger picture of redemption in here is not just the fact that Ruth was the kinsman redeemer that rescued Naomi and, and Ruth out of poverty and slavery, But it's this picture here, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He is your deliverer. He is the one who is rescuing you. Boaz sees this bigger picture of redemption, right? Saying, God, you have come under the wings of Yahweh. But in a smaller sense here, when Ruth then lays down at the feet of Boaz, and what does she what does she say? To him, in verse 9 of chapter 3, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings. Same same language. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. All right, so there's a a picture here going on. Here, I'll let you, you want to model? Sure. And I'll talk about it. You want me to go out here so they can see you? Yeah, come out here so they can see you in the camera. Probably, yes, about right there. All right, so I'm going to put this on Jason right here like that. Okay, what is this? What would we call this? Anybody know? Do you know what this is? Can you see it? Anybody know what this is? It's a prayer shawl. Yeah, this is, we would say this is a prayer shawl. All right, this would have been worn... Uh, by Jewish men and women would have worn prayer shawls in the Old Testament. This comes out of the Torah. They are told in Numbers chapter 15 to wear this. It's called a tallit. This whole thing is called a tallit. All right? These ends right here, all these little tassels, it's just a fun word. They're called zitzits. All right? 
These are little tassels on the ends of these things. It also has corners, all right? These corners of this garment here are actually called kanafs. All right, this in Numbers chapter 15, God tells them, I want you to wear this, but he gives them a specific reason why they are to wear it. It is so that they will remember the word of God. God's promises to them, God's rescue of them out of Egypt, God's covenant with them that he would take them to be his people and that all he says is that you would obey me and love me with all your heart and not chase after other gods, right? I mean, this is the promise he's made. And so he says, I want you to wear this because each of these little, there's so much like imagery in in Judaism because he wants them to remember things. Each of these little zitzits are meant for you to hold and every one you hold, you're meant to think about different parts of the Old Testament. It's like a way for you just to, as you're thinking about the word of God, each of these tassels represent the word of God. And so they would wear this. Um, and so it was, a remi- it was a physical reminder to them of the word of God. But these corners, right, these corners of this called the kanaf, they had another name. Anybody want to take a guess at what the corners of this garment were named? Wings. Wings. Hold the wings out, Pastor. Do you see that? Like when you just hold, you spread your arms out, they look like wings, right? And so this language is all through the Old Testament, and you may have never really thought about how many times the word wings are used in the Old Testament, and, and the reason those words are used. This idea of wings in the Old Testament, they are used for rescue. God tells them in Exodus, like I have brought you out of Egypt on eagles' wings. It is used for refuge. David in the Psalms talks about hide me in the shelter of your wings. He says, I want to come into the tent and be under your wings. You ever think about like going into your prayer closet? Did you hear, you remember that language? And even in the New Testament, they would take their prayer shawl and if they just wanted to get alone with God and just contemplate his word and cry out to him, they could, they could put their prayer shawl up over their head and almost just be in their own personal little prayer closet or tent as they're thinking about being under God's wings, this place of refuge, this place of, of safety. But it goes even deeper than that. In in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, uh, in verse 8, I want to read this one for you. You can write it down and go back and look at it later. But in Ezekiel 16, 8, the prophet says this as a word from the Lord. When I passed by you again and I saw you. Right, he's first of all talked about their condition. He said that they, um, back in verse 6, he said, I passed by you once and I saw that you were wallowing in your own blood. I, saw, I said to you in your blood, live. But then it says, and then when I passed by you again in verse 8 and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And so look, what does it say? So I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. And I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Right? The old covenant picture in Exodus, when God enters into, the co- into a covenant with Israel, it is a marriage covenant. He is, in, in a very real sense, spreading his wings over his people and becoming their God, and they are becoming his people. It is this marriage-type covenant that God is making. And in Ezekiel, God is reminding them of this picture of, hey, I saw you in your condition, right? And you were helpless, and you were hopeless, and you had no life, but I have given you life, and I have brought you under my wings, and I have made a covenant with you declares the Lord. And what did he say? You became mine. So this picture of coming under his wings is this picture of protection. And it's this picture of coming under his authority. Authority is a beautiful thing, isn't it? We don't even have time to go into what a 
powerful thing it is to come under the authority of God, right? In our sin nature, we want to rebel against that. But is there any safer place to be than under the authority of God? No, because when you're under God's authority, you're under God's protection and God's provision, right? So this picture of coming under his wings is this picture of coming under his authority and living under his authority because it is good, and he wants to bless you and provide for you. And so it's this protection. But also, when it talks about his wings, there's a prophecy in Malachi chapter 4. As the Old Testament closes, and Pastor Jason was talking about it just a few minutes ago, how do we leave in the Old Testament? The children of Israel are where? They are, are they free? They're, they're enslaved, right? They, they, are, they, are, they are enslaved. And so there is this promise in chapter four, behold, verse one, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers evil will be stubble. And the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his healing in his wings so when boaz says ruth you have come under the wings of the lord this is what he's talking about but when boaz takes his garment and he spreads it over ruth what is he doing he is saying, you were coming under my protection. I am going to redeem you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to rescue you, right? You're going to be safe. I'm going to provide for you. Oh, but then in the New Testament, oh my goodness, if you were to look in Luke chapter 8, there is a story where Jesus heals a woman who has had an issue of blood that she has gone to every doctor. She spent every dime she has trying to be healed. And what does she do to find healing? What does is, what is Luke chapter 8? She touches the, the, hem, the thread of his garment. Yeah, she touches the corner, one of the corners, the wings. She touches the wing of Jesus' prayer shawl. His tallit. What did Malachi prophesy about the one who would come, this son of righteousness? What would be in his wings? Healing. Right? So there's this picture, this beautiful picture of Jesus, the son of righteousness is coming. There is healing in his wings. Right? It's this idea. But then in Matthew chapter 23, as Jesus, just before he goes to the cross, is looking over the people of Israel, over Jerusalem, and he's weeping over Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, this is in verse 37 of chapter 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that killed the prophets and stones though who were sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? but you were not willing. Do you see, even in, even in just this imagery that we see in Ruth, but we see it all through scripture, this picture of the wings of God and all that it represents is a picture of redemption. What's involved in redemption, in buying back, rescue, refuge, provision, protection, healing, Restoration, we used that word earlier as we thought about what it means to be redeemed. But all of scripture is pointing to where is the source of that? It comes from him, Jesus, the son of righteousness, right? And, and coming under that protection of, of him. He is the redeemer, amen? It is a fabulous, fabulous picture of what we're talking about tonight. And it's woven through 
the entire Bible. And so I love when you read that. I don't ever want you to read Ruth the same way again when you read that picture of, of oh, let me, let me come under the shelter of your wings, right? I mean, you, you just see Jesus in that, right? That he is the one who did what Ruth was a foreigner and a stranger. She was poor. She was helpless with no future and no hope. But the kindness of Boaz covered her and took her to be his own and redeemed her. Is that our testimony in Jesus? A hundred percent. And right, so when he says, come to me, this is that picture. Come to me, come into the shelter of my wings because I will redeem you. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's why that Galatians passage, <clears throat> when it talked about redemption, it said that you go from being a slave to being what? Adopted. A son, right? Or a daughter. So when, when you see that imagery, don't you get it now, what it means to come underneath his wings? It, it's, it's all of that ownership, right? He calls you his own to gather you. You're no longer a slave. You, you are mine. Yeah. Amen. It's so good, isn't it? So are you going to think about redemption the same way? When you read that word in Scripture, I hope not. I hope every time you see the word redeem and redemption now, like it just takes on such a deeper, richer meaning for you about the heart of God for you, Right? He's not just checking a box to say you're redeemed. No, it is intimate. It is personal. Like to redeem you, he is bringing you to himself. And there is no safer, better place of refuge and security and provision than right there under the shelter of his wings. Um, it's a picture of redemption. So next week, um, we'll pick back up. I'll think through what we're going to do to stay on track. We'll probably jump into reconciliation and maybe try to uh, start into sanctification. I don't know. We may just do reconciliation. You'll just have to come back next week and see, see what we do, okay? We've kept you two minutes longer than we should have. God bless you guys. Have a great night.